The Romance of the Ranchos. Culver City, 1839. Padres protest grant of land to rancheros. Playa del Rey, 1887. Seaside resort to become Great Harbor. Venice, 1904. Great seaside resort copies after European city. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization of the romantic and colorful past that created our Southern California of today. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns with a fascinating true story of the days of the dawn. Day before yesterday, several million more American citizens completed their registration for service with our armed forces. Many of them will be called to active duty. Many may actually lay down their lives in the service of our country. Most of us will not have to make that supreme sacrifice, but all of us are in this war and all of us are in the service. And one service that we can all render is to help finance the country's war effort, to help provide the weapons so desperately needed by those fellow citizens of ours who will do the actual fighting. Our dimes and dollars invested in defense bonds and stamps are the weapons most of us must use. Use them often and regularly by defense bonds and stamps. Now here is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, to tell us the story. Buenas noches, senoras y señores. Tonight our wanderings take us to the Rancho La Ballona, the great valley stretching from the Baldwin Hills to Playa del Rey on the south and to Pico Boulevard on the north, and containing the thriving communities of Playa del Rey, Culver City, Palms, Barn City, Ocean Park, Venice, and part of Santa Monica. It's a story that covers over a hundred years, and it's full of the romance of the ranchos. <laughs> The story of the Rancho La Ballona starts back in 1819, while the Pueblo at Los Angeles was still a sleepy little village. At that time, only a few old soldiers had received grants of lands from the government and had started the first ranchos. But their example gave other men ideas, among them the young Machado brothers. One of them, Augustine, approached his friend Tomas Talamantes. Tomas, mi amigo, you do have some cattle. Si. Sí. My brother and I. And as it is now, our cattle must graze on the community lands which belong to the Pueblo. See, si, along with everybody else's. But it is good land. See, si, good land, but there is not enough of it. Our cattle are starving because there is not enough land for all the herds. Starving? Augustine, oh, you exaggerate. It might be better if there was more land, but what can we do about it? Well, that's just it. We can do something. Tomas, have you not heard of Don Jose Verdugo? Si, of course. And Manuel Nieto? Si. And Don Jose Dominguez and Don Antonio Maria Lugo? Of course, of course, but what of them? What of them? You mean to tell me you do not know that they long ago have obtained land for themselves on which to keep their cattle? Oh, si, ranchos. Si, ranchos. And what they can do, you can do also. I? I can have a rancho? See, si, all you have to do is ask for it. But what do I want with a rancho? A place to keep your cattle, of course. But I already have a place on the Pueblo land. Ah, you are worse than hopeless. Look, would you not like to have a place where you could raise more cattle? Make more money and become a big man? Mm, perhaps. Perhaps. Duh. Your brother Felipe has more sense. Hmm? He has already said he would go in with us. Go in with you? Pro proposition. My brother Ignacio and I have some cattle. See, si. And your brother Felipe and you have some cattle. See, si. None of us has enough cattle to stock a rancho by himself, but the four of us together have more than enough. Ah, you wish us to ask for a rancho. That is the general idea. And why did you not say so? I could have saved you much trouble. I could have told you I would not like to live on a rancho. Oh. I am quite satisfied to rest my bones in the shade of the Pueblo. You do not have to live on the rancho, Tomas. 
You can stay here. My brother and I will live there and keep the cat. Then why, mi amigo, are you so anxious for us to join you? You two have enough cattle to stock a rancho. Why not just go ahead and ask for the rancho yourself? Because, well, just because... See? Si? Well, because we could not get it. Could not? And why not? Because neither my brother nor I are... See? Si? Well, we are not old enough. It is very silly, but they will not grant ranches to young men. So we thought, uh, you being older, <laughs> perhaps... <laughs> so that is the reason. Well, my boy, maybe we can help you after all. Tomas, I am no boy, and you know it. Never mind, son. We shall help you get your toy. Ah. But tell me, where is this rancho of ours going to be? Oh, it is a very fine piece of land. Most fertile, good for grazing. But where? From the pass of the Caretas to the sea. What? You mean way out there in the wilderness? Nonsense. It is only some four or five leagues from the Pueblo. Only a whole day's journey? Ah, I will help you get it, mi amigo. But you will never get me out there to live. That I can promise you. Uh, Senores Machados y Senores Talamantes, you have petitioned the land called La Ballona. hmm? Si, Capitan. You are going to give us permission to move our cattle there, no? Well, as military commander, I have that authority. But something has come up. The padres of the Mission San Gabriel have protested against my giving you permission to use this land. But why? It is not their land. Well, they say it is. They say all of this land, uh, except the Pueblo lands, are theirs for their cattle and their interests. Nonsense. You have given permission for other rancheros to take land? Ah, si, I... Suppose that is why the padres are protesting. Well, then if you have done it for others, you are obliged to give us permission. It is no more than right. See, si, si, that is so. But uh, I do not know what may come of this. I shall have to send word to the city of Mexico to find out whether I am right or the padres are right. But in the meantime, Capitan, you give us permission? Mm, See, si, with reservations. Provisionally, you understand. See, si. But you must build a house and stock the rancho with cattle. That is more than the padres have done. And I think that that will satisfy the government in Mexico. So, senores, Rancho La Ballona is yours. Fortunately, Captain Noriega's provisional permit was not questioned. Many years later, in 1839, Governor Alvarado fully legalized the four men's possession of the Rancho La Ballona by issuing a grant to them. The Talimantes still didn't live on the land, and Ignacio Machado had moved to the Rancho Aguaje de la Centinela, leaving Augustine Machado in full charge of La Ballona. In the peaceful, happy years that followed, La Ballona became famous as the home of excellent white wine. Augustine Machado's vineyards produced a vintage much in demand in the north, and agents constantly called at the rancho. You have only 12 barrels, Mr. De Senor. See, si, the others took all the rest I can spare. You have more for your own use? Oh, see, si, a few barrels. Mm-hmm. How many? Mm, 10, 12, something like that. Well, I'll give you 10 pesos apiece for each barrel here, if you'll add those other 10. $10 for an 18 gallon barrel of vino? Oh, Senor, I would feel I had robbed you. Well, you needn't, Senor, because between you and me, do you know what your vino sells for up north? No. How much? Twenty-five pesos a barrel. And that's a nice profit. Madre sacra! Twenty-five pesos! For that much, I should carry these barrels north myself. All of the luxuries of life, and indeed some of its necessities in that early period of Southern California, were obtained from the trading vessels which anchored off San Pedro. It was the custom for all the rancheros, like Augustine Machado to go aboard the ships and purchase whatever merchandise pleased them, pledging so many cattle hides in return. It was on one such occasion that Augustine Machado was highly insulted. And uh, will that be all, senor? See, si, I think so. I have brought almost 300 hides worth. See, si, that's right. Now, will you be kind enough to sign this note? Huh? What note? That's right, note, guarantee. You understand, I must have some security for the hides you'll owe us. Guarantee? Security? Oh, senor, what do you mean? Oh, just that I've got to have it. Senor, the... you are new at Supercargo, are you not? Well, yes, I'm only the assistant. That is what I thought. And your superior is lax in his advice to you. 
Surely he knows that the word of a Californiano is as good as any bond. Word? You mean a gentleman's agreement? Of course. Well, senor, we don't usually do business that way. In California, that is the way we do business, senor. You had better find that out now before you have no business. But if you must have your security, then here it is, senor. Uh, what, what are you doing? Plucking your bond, senor. Here, deliver this to your owner. Tell him it is a hair from the beard of Augustine Machado. That is security enough for any man. The word of the Californian was his bond, and it was as good as gold. This was the spirit in which they lived, and it was a good life. The peaceful flow of events on Rancho La Bolona was uninterrupted by the American occupation or the subsequent change of government. The United States Land Commission upheld the brothers Talamantes and Machado's claim to the land. But in 1854 came an event which was to destroy the simple harmony that had existed. Don Tomas Talamantes approached Don Benito Wilson, the American ranchero. Don Benito, as one ranchero to another, I, I need your help. I'll be glad to do anything for you that I can, Don Tomas. What is it? Well, I, uh, I need money. Oh, Oh, I've heard that story too many times of late. It seems we all need dinero, doesn't it, Don Tomas? See, that is an evil, perhaps, but a necessary one. I must have it. How much, senor? Fifteen hundred dollars. Hmm, that's a lot. Oh, see? But you have plenty. You will be able to spare me that much. See, I suppose I will. The way things are now, senor, I need it too. Hmm? And with money so badly needed and all, I'm afraid I'll have to ask for some security on this loan. Security, senor? Oh, but surely you know that Don't I... Don't Tomas, I hate to say this. I know that your honor is above question. But it's not a question of honor anymore. It's a question of your ability to pay. I know you'll want to, but it's a bad risk, senor. Whether you'll be able to pay or not is hard to say, and I haven't so much I can afford to throw it away. So I'll have to ask you to put up some security. But, senor, I, I have nothing except the land of La Bayona, uh, my undivided share. Well, that will have to do, then. I will give you the money for a mortgage on your share of La Bayona. As Wilson had expected, Don Tomas was unable to pay off the loan, and Wilson had to foreclose. Now, for the first time, an American-owned part of the land. The ownership of the land became more and more complicated with the years. Felipe Talemantes died, leaving about 25 heirs. A few years later, Augustine Machado died, leaving heirs. Finally, the last of the original owners, Ignacio Machado, decided to deed his interest to his relatives. Well, Don Ignacio, all I can say is that I'm glad I've already sold my share to the other American senores. Why do you say that, Don Benito? Because when you deed your interest to all your relatives, the Rancho La Bullona is going to be owned by about 30 people, all of them with undivided interests. That's too many for such a small piece of land. What will they do? They can't all live there, keep their cattle. I don't suppose La Bullona will be much of a cattle ranch anymore. But you're right. They can't all live there together, very peacefully in a way, until they know just which land is whose. But how will they know that, senor? There's only one thing I can see to do. Apply to have the rancho partitioned. Then each one will get his share of it, and they'll all be happy. See, that is what they'll have to do before they all start scratching each other's eyes out. And so the Rancho La Bellona was partitioned. A few years later, when the boom of the 80s engulfed California, part of the rancho was broken up again into city streets and lots of a community called the Palms. And at the mouth of La Bellona Creek, there was great activity, too. It was there on the beach that Moy L. Wicks talked to an engineer. So you see, Mr. Crable, that's the layout. The tides back up in the creek mouth and form a lagoon. In flood season, they make this all a marshland. But we can reclaim the land and make this a great harbor with one operation. You mean by dredging the lagoon? That's it. That's the idea. We're going to make Port Bologna the big shipping terminal for Southern California. We've already granted a right-of-way to the California Central Railroad. They're starting to build out here, so it's high time we started at this end. And that's my job? Right. It's your job to make this a harbor. Now, I see a 200-foot channel right through here and a two-mile inner harbor up this lagoon, three to 600 feet wide and six to 20 feet deep. Well, you have vision, Mr. Wicks, but it's not going to be as easy as you think. These tides and the sand will make dredging difficult. Oh, I'm not worried. You're a good man, and you'll get the job done, I'm sure. 
In the meantime, I'll be busy building the first piers and the town of Port Balloon up on the bluffs there. All right, Mr. Wicks. I'll try. But let's not be too optimistic. Determinedly, M.L. Wicks went ahead with his plans. On the bluff, above what is now Playa del Rey, he laid out the town of Port Ballona, brought prospective buyers on excursion trips to see it. Lots were sold, buildings started. The California Central Railway, now the Santa Fe, completed their road to the proposed port, and celebrations took place. But the harbor itself was slow in taking shape. And suddenly, the real estate boom of the 80s crashed of its own weight. With great concern, Wicks came to engineer Hugh Crable. Mr. Crable, something has to be done. Our funds are fast running out. We're not selling any lots, not building anything. It's not my end of it, Mr. Wicks. No, of course not. But it's because of you. People say, where's the port? We can't see any harbor. And what can I tell them? I can't see it either. When are you going to have some results? You want my honest opinion, Wicks? Of course. Never. What do you mean, never? I mean it's an impossible task. We'll never be able to make a harbor here. The tides, the shifting sand, they undo our work as fast as we can do it. It would cost more to make and keep this harbor open than it would ever be worth. You... you're joking. Not at all. I thought in the beginning it might be like this. After these months of work, I'm sure of it. I'm sorry, Mr. Wicks, but I'm afraid your Port Bologna was only a dream. Did you know that the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles maintains the largest collection of early California photographs in existence? This collection consists of 10,000 negatives and plates, and more than 15,000 prints, some dating back over 80 years. They were gathered by Mr. C.C. C. Pierce, who came here as a young photographer from Chicago 56 years ago. Through the years, he photographed just about everything he saw of interest. Early day buildings, bicycle and tally-ho clubs, railroad and harbor construction, the first airplane meet, landmarks, Indians, balloon races, fiestas, visiting notables, people and things and scenes of every description. And all the while, Mr. Pierce also collected earlier pictures taken by others before his arrival in the West. So important became the historical value of this collection that the Huntington Library purchased many of these prints a few years ago. To preserve for this community and for California, not only the prints but the negatives, Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles some months ago purchased the entire collection. Only occasionally can the company use the pictures in its own work, but authorities agree that to the community and the state, the collection may well be invaluable in years to come. The optimistic plans for the magnificent port of La Bologna fell through, and the company dissolved. Never again was it to be thought of as a center for commerce and industry. Instead, it took a new lease on life when, in 1902, the Beach Land Company renamed it Playa del Rey and started subdivision of a resort and beach community. A great hotel was built, lots were laid out, beach frontage sold. The lagoon became canals, alive with boats, swimmers, and fishermen. A great holiday crowd poured into the resort on the newly completed Pacific Electric, then called the Los Angeles, Hermosa Beach, and Redondo Railway. One of the things to attract every eye was located on the Palisades above the beach. I don't get it, do you? No, never heard of a name like that. Not for a car, anyway. Alphonse. What kind of a car is it? All lopsided like that. It's one of them cable cars. This here is an inclined railway. Uh-oh, there it goes. Go darn it. Look, it's climbing right up the side of the hill. Come on, let's get out of the way. It's going to tip over and come down on Wait us. Wait a minute, you fool. That's just what it's supposed to do. Look up there. The other car on the second track's coming down. You mean every time this one goes up, the other one comes down? Sure. That's the way the incline works. I'll be horn foggy. Say, look at that. This car coming down's got a name, too. Yep. See, that one's uh, Gaston. Gaston. Well, that's as goofy as the first one. What's it mean? <laughs> Don't you get it? Alphonse and Gaston. The uh, two little men are so polite, each one wants the other to go ahead. Well, that's the way with them cars. They never can get together. On the high ground farther inland, a new city was born. First called Washington Park, lots and streets were laid out close to what was already known as the Palms. A year later, in 1913, a banquet was held at which the founder, Harry H. Culver, made an announcement. Well, well, 
Well, we're all ready to go. The preliminaries are finished, the streets laid out, the town flooded. We've only got one building so far. That's my real estate office. But it won't be the only one for long. This town's going to grow and grow fast. Before long at all, we'll have a real city. Half business, half residential. Yes, sir, Culver City. Within a year, Culver City had stores, homes, a factory, a newspaper, a railroad station, a lighting system, and 600 real estate salesmen. But Culver City was not the only scene of activity on Rancho La Ballona, where in 1904, along the beach above Playa del Rey, had sprung up a new town founded by the enterprising Easterner, Abbott Kinney. But the visitor to this community was in for a surprise. Oh, whoa, Betsy. Well, George, that's where we get out. Why do you mean, get out? I thought you were taking me to a town. I am, I am. Then come on, let's ride on in. I don't feel much like walking. No, you're not going to walk the rest of the way. You're not going to ride either. I suppose I'm going to fly, huh? Hey, look here, Jim. I ain't much in the mood for fooling. You dragged me clear out here to the beach to see a new town, and now you want to joke about it. I told you this wasn't like no town you ever saw. Now, come on, see for yourself. Well, where is this town? Right down the street here. What are you talking about? I don't see no street. It's right here in front of you. And our carriage is waiting right there. Man, you plumb loony. All I see is a ditch full of water. Ditch? Man, that's a canal. Huh? That there gondola is our carriage. We're going the rest of the way by boat. What in town nation... I told you this town was different. There ain't no streets here, just canals. If you want to go down the street, you take a boat. Well, I'll be doggone. This here's Venice. Mr. Kinney figures to make it just like Venice, Italy. And he's sure doing it. I believe me, this is going to be the place for folks to come for long. Abbott Kinney's vision founded the town of Venice. At first a curiosity spot, later a great resort along with its neighbor Ocean Park. Its canals have given way to modern streets, and today Venice is a great community of homes, and one of the Southland's famous pleasure spots. As the years passed, community sprang up all over Rancho La Ballona. Then, in 1915, an event took place which was to give great impetus to the growth of Little Culver City. On the beach above Santa Monica, a pioneer motion picture director was working. All right, come on, get a little farther. Show some emotion, George. Don't just sit there. All right, no. No, 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 man. This simply won't do. It's not going to look right, no matter how hard we try. Now, what we need is a river, and don't anybody suggest the Los Angeles River. I mean a river with some water in it. Oh, uh, Mr. Rents. Huh? What is it? Mr. Rents, I think maybe I can help you. Yeah? Well, who are you? My name's Harry H. Culver. I'm a real estate man. Well, what are you doing around here? Well, I just happened to see you working here, and I thought I'd stop and watch. Very interested in motion pictures. I believe they have a great future. Of course they do. But... <laughs> What was this you said about being able to help me? Yes, I, I think I can. You said you needed a river with water in it. I do. Yeah. Script calls for a scene with three canoes full of Indians paddling down a stream. All I have to work with is the ocean. It doesn't look right. Well, uh, I know where there is a stream, yeah, and it has water in it. So do I. But it's 500 miles away. Well, mine isn't. It's right here, hmm? less than 15 miles away, near my town of Culver City. You mean it really looks like a river? Sure. Well, man, you're a lifesaver. What are we waiting for? Come on, lead us to it. For lunch. We'll shoot the rest this afternoon. Ah, hello there, Mr. Culver. Hello, Mr. Rents. How's it going? Fine, fine. Thanks to your Bologna Creek here. We'll be finished in no time. This isn't a bad location for a picture studio, is it, Mr. Rents? Hills over there, river here, ocean not far, always plenty of sunlight. Ah, uh, wouldn't be bad. Yes, we've already got one small studio, the Kale Motion Picture Company in Culver City. I'd uh, like to have another. What for? We don't amount to very much yet. Maybe not yet. But your flickering pictures are going to make a big industry someday soon. Going to employ thousands of people. You're right there, of course. Yes, and maybe you're right about this being a good place for us. Sure. Sure, Mr. Culver, maybe you can show me some of your land. I might be plenty interested. 
When Thomas Ince moved his picture studio to a lot on Washington Boulevard, he started a great industry for Culver City. On that same lot today stands the great Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer plant, home lot of many of the brightest stars of Hollywood and many of its greatest pictures. Other studios came to Culver City in succeeding years through the efforts of Mr. Culver, including Keystone, Biograph, Griffith, Senate, Goldwyn, RKO, Hal Roach, Pathé, and Selznick. Culver City for many years has been one of the great centers for motion picture production in Southern California. But there are other incentives for the growth of Culver City. It was fast becoming a great city of residential homes, and Harry H. Culver was a born community developer. He introduced attention-getting advertising to stimulate sales of real estate in Culver City. People are attracted by anything moving. If an object stands still, people will not pay much attention to it. So we're going to be on the move all the time. Give them action, something to watch. And then just watch us grow. Let's have carnivals. Gee whiz, look at that. A searchlight on top of City Hall. They're having a marathon race from Los Angeles to Culver City. Who ever heard of a baby contest of the building lot for a prize? Glory be. A free trip around the world. Just for the best name for our city park. You can't play polo in automobiles. Who says you can't play polo in automobiles? Look at that. They're doing it. Well, anyway, they were doing it. Under the guidance of the expert developer Harry H. Culver, Culver City grew. Today, it is a beautiful and prosperous community of homes and gardens. Together with Palms, Venice, Ocean Park, and Playa del Rey, it spreads out over the great Rancho La Ballona, the domain of the early Californians. And where once Port Ballona was started, the creek has been dredged and improved into a channel now perfect for boat racing. The marshlands have been reclaimed, and development of this land into residential and industrial property is a possibility within the near future. Such is the story of progress, and such is the romance of the rancho. In just a moment, Frank Graham will be back to give you a preview of next week's story. The historical photograph collection I told you about a few minutes ago, which incidentally contains pictures of the Venice canals and many other scenes and places in tonight's story, is but one of the many ways in which Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles seeks to serve its community. But the company's primary service, the real justification of its existence, lies in the fulfillment of its obligations to its customers, present and future. This obligation, as the company's officers and personnel see it, is to provide the most complete, the most accurate, and most prompt land title insurance service of which they are capable. And to give this service, which is your protection against loss when you deal in real property, at rates which are substantially lower than the average cost of such service elsewhere. And now, Frank, what's the story for next week? Next week, we're going to tell an exciting incident from the history of the American conquest of California. It's the story of a wild and difficult ride by a lone horseman racing to get help for his comrades. And the central character is Juan Flacco, who was known as Lean John. Be sure to hear this exciting chapter from The Romance of the Ranchos. So until next week, this is your wandering vaquero Frank Graham saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. The Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss, with special music arranged by Irwin Yo. Bob Lamond speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.